Welcome everyone to this lunch presentation. Uh, my name is Mark Newman. I'm the president and founder of Precision Analytical. You might know us as the makers of the Dutch test. Uh, we want to thank IFM for giving us this opportunity. And I want to thank my friend and colleague, Dr. Doreen Saltiel for joining me in this venture. We've been trying to perfect hormone testing for a long time. And that's what the Dutch test offers is a really comprehensive look at reproductive and adrenal hormones. And we'll talk a little bit about testing at the end as it relates to hormone replacement therapy. But the question I really wanted to dig into that I needed some help with is the issue of the risks and benefits of HRT, of should providers be giving women estrogen and progesterone and in what situations and in what doses and which routes of administration? And that's a really complex topic. And I think it gives providers some anxiety not knowing what do all of the studies say and where does the balance of that really leave us? And so for that question, I turn to Dr. Saltiel because she's trained in as a cardiologist originally, but also in functional medicine. But additionally, she has a law degree. So she's really the perfect person for me to really dig into the literature, comprehensively study this topic, and then to present it to you both in written form. So we have a document that we've created that really goes through the topic you're about to hear about in great detail and can be a really, really good resource for you in your practice. And what she's gonna to do today is take a little tour through all of that evidence to really leave us with a great understanding of where we stand today. What does the evidence show about hormone replacement therapy in terms of the benefits and the risks? And so I'm gonna turn it over to her and I think you're really gonna benefit from her experience in really trying to comprehensively understand this issue. So Dr. Saltiel, thank you so much for joining us today. Mark, thank you for that kind introduction. I've been practicing cardiology for more than 30 years. And during that time, I always wished that I had more time to read. This past year, my wish came true. In addition to continuing my growth as a cardiologist, I wanted to further my growth as a hormone expert. And that's exactly what I did. I read just about everything out there on hormones that I could find, well over 500 articles. And my hope is during these next 20 or so minutes, I will highlight for you some of what I've learned and provide you with some practical pointers. Let's start by defining menopause. It's no menstrual cycle times a year. It really is a retrospective diagnosis. So what we're going to talk about today, remember also applies to perimenopausal women. Physicians, struggle with whether or not they should provide hormone therapy for their patients. Patients struggle with, should I take hormone therapy? And that's because of all the hype surrounding breast cancer, cardiovascular disease, and a little bit about endometrial cancer, but, but much less uh, around endometrial cancer than breast cancer and cardiovascular disease, despite all the benefits that estradiol provides. The data says it's clear that estradiol improves vasomotor symptoms, relieves vulvovaginal atrophy, and prevents osteoporosis. We'll get to cognitive decline at another time. Let's start by dismantling the risks or the hype around the risks so that we can focus on the benefits. Two clinical pearls. The dose, and I'm assuming the majority of you, like me, use transdermal estradiol. The dose we use is a key determinant when deciding on whether an oral micronized progesterone or vaginal micronized progesterone dose. And in addition, a woman's endometrial health at the time you're going to prescribe hormones is equally important when determining that dose. I knew that. But clearly, that was something I was reminded as I marched through the literature. When we talk about the endometrium, progesterone is clearly the star of the show. 
we all know that estradiol alone increases endometrial hyperplasia and the risk for endometrial cancer. But the question always remains, is the doses that we use of oral micronized progesterone or vaginal micronized progesterone, do those doses protect the endometrium? And I can very comfortably say and reassure you that they do. In fact, Gillette used a one and a half milligrams of estrogel, which is a high dose, and there was no endometrial mitosis. When we come over to the Replenish study, which used a milligram of oral estradiol, which I'm not promoting with oral micronized progesterone, 100 milligrams, which is fine, they also found endometrial protection. But more importantly, what they noted is that a baseline serum estradiol of greater than 10 picograms per mil or a Dutch urine of 0.5 to 0.6 nanograms per milligram, those women who had those levels had an increased risk of endometrial proliferation. So now I look at Dutch urine and I, in, in women that I see that, I say, hmm, do they need more progesterone or do I need to refer them for further evaluation? But a key point to make is that the only randomized control trial that evaluated oral micronized progesterone was the PEPI trial. It was a three-year trial, and that's why most guidelines, in addition to this very large observational study, and KEEPS recommend 200 milligrams. But these other things do work. Well, the bottom line about transdermal progesterone, whether you think it's protective or whether you don't think it's protective, all of the key authors, the key opinion leaders who write in this field, none of them recommend using transdermal progesterone to protect the endometrium. Whether you're looking at the authors who say it's not protective, Ren primed the endometrium with 0.1 milligrams of Plymara and used increasing doses of transdermal progesterone. This one equals just about 300 milligrams of oral progesterone. And what he found is not only was there no endometrial protection, there was no progestogenic effect at all the endometrium was being affected primarily by estradiol alone. So there was a lot of mitotic activity. Vashis looked at endometrial hyperplasia and proliferation also. And what he found is that 32 out of every 100 women developed endometrial proliferation and or endometrial hyperplasia. Whereas Leonetti found that if you use transdermal progesterone, 20 BID twice a day, a much lower dose with standard uh, CEE, you got endometrial protection. However, she states, we don't recommend progesterone cream until longer and larger studies are performed. And to date, there are no longer and larger studies. So the bottom line is, when you prescribe transdermal estradiol, choose your oral or vaginal dose that balances that transdermal estradiol dose so you protect the endometrium. You can use serum or urine. I happen to use urine to determine whether I need a higher progesterone dose or I need to refer them for further evaluation. And the literature to date does not recommend transdermal progesterone for endometrial protection. Well, we know it's clear estradiol increases endometrial cancer but we know how to mitigate that with progesterone. But what about breast cancer? There has been a lot of hype around hormone therapy and breast cancer. And in fact, sorry about that. And in fact, uh, it is all based on the WHI. We know that there are absolute contraindications. These are some of them. They're not all inclusive. And we know that there are relative contraindications. So with both and your patient, whether they're absolute or relative, you have a discussion and you decide together whether or not hormone therapy is a reasonable option for the patient. 
Well, I group the studies according to outcomes. And I think that's easier to see, but look where all the studies group. They group around the decrease in breast cancer, which I found surprising as I was reading um, the, all the studies that, that supported estradiol decreases breast cancer. Well, unfortunately, the WHI changed the landscape of how we practice medicine. It's it was truly a political nightmare, but its primary purpose was to, to take what we already knew in recently menopausal women, the benefits of hormone therapy, and apply it to the older menopausal woman who was more likely to get those diseases, cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, colon cancer. Unfortunately, the authors of the JAMA publication, who were not the investigators, put breast cancer at the forefront and documented this increased breast cancer risk at two and a half to three years. They ignored the CEE alone findings. They grouped everything together and stated hormones cause breast cancer, cause increased breast cancer. There are a lot of reanalysis out there. My favorite one is the one by Hodes and Sorrell. It's very easy to read. They looked at all of the WHI data and what they found is that in the women who use conjugated equine estrogen alone for 7.2 years, there was a 45% statistically significant breast cancer mortality reduction after 18 follow-up years. That's huge. We don't use CEE. We use a safer option, transdermal estradiol. So we know there's not going to be an increased breast cancer risk. And in fact, We'll, you'll see that there's a decreased breast cancer risk. The combined group that got all the hype, it was because one placebo group had an unusually low breast cancer incidence. Let me show you. If you look at the right side of the screen here, you will see that these two lines are almost identical. They go up identically. These are women who are hormone naive, who are randomized. The annualized breast cancer incidence is the same. This is in the combined group. And then you get to the women who use prior hormones. They had a washout period. They were randomized to hormone or placebo. And just as an aside, this placebo group was younger than the combined hormone therapy group in the prior hormone use. But what they found, the curves diverged at two and a half to three years. And why was that? Well, the authors focused on, oh my God, there's an increased breast cancer incidence. When in fact, there was a lower annualized breast cancer incidence in this control group. And this was validated with all the other control groups in the WHI, the WHI observation study, the vitamin D study, the dietary study, and all of the placebo groups looked more like this one did. And if you pick this curve up and place it on top, you will see it is just about the same. So instead of stating the actual truth, which was there was a low, lower breast cancer incidence here, they focused on this portion of the curve, which was actually incorrect. And in 2017, the original investigators published that hormone therapy was not associated with the risk of all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, or cancer mortality. So I think at this juncture, it's time to put the WHI studies to bed and not use it as a foundation or a springboard to compare other studies or our treatment decisions to. Here are two studies that actually corroborate what POTUS and all the other reanalysis authors found, that estradiol decreases breast cancer and breast cancer mortality. Stops treatment for 11 years, not seven more, not 7.2, but 11. And they found a decreased breast cancer mortality. 
finish, the reason I focus on finish is because they use doses that we use and drugs very similar to what we use. They only use 17 beta estradiol. And look what they found that E2 had the greatest breast cancer mortality reduction. However, all hormone users had a statistically significant reduction in breast cancer mortality, even when hormone therapy was continued for greater than 10 years. The largest mortality reduction was in the five to 10 year group. And age at initiation was not related to breast cancer mortality. So we know estradiol decreases breast cancer, using uh, oral micronized progesterone or progesterone with it, even for greater than 10 years, doesn't increase breast cancer. But what about estradiol and increased breast cancer? Well, two studies, the million women's that a lot of people quote and E3N. Million women, randomized women, and use that randomization data for all of their analysis. They did not take into account any of the follow-ups. This was about a four-year study. There was no oral micronized progesterone data provided. But what they found is that 1.2 years after recruitment, women develop breast cancer. And then 1.7 years later, these women die. This is biologically implausible. It takes about 10 years for breast cancer cells to become clinically evident and if you're going to say something is causal, it can't happen within 1.2 years or 1.7 years. What can happen is these women had underlying breast cancer lesions that were not diagnosed. They didn't do optimum screening. And that the estradiol then fostered or promoted further growth. That's very reasonable. In addition, more than a third of the women used more than one hormone regimen. And similar to the WHI, what we just saw, the control group had a lower breast cancer mortality than the general population. And what about E3N? They only used transdermal estradiol. And what they found is that transdermal estradiol increased breast cancer. However, when you add oral micronized progesterone to that, the breast cancer risk was eliminated up to five years. That's the bottom line of all these three studies. However, the estradiol alone group, 72% of them use estradiol and a progestin. And in the estradiol and oral micronized progesterone group, 57 used E2 with a progestin. This is not clean data and shouldn't be used as an example of uh, estradiol causing breast cancer. But what about progesterone? We see there's no increased risk. Even when treatments continued for 10 years, these are these two studies actually corroborating what the Finnish study or McCola found. So again, we're starting to build a story here. But what about the oral micronized progesterone dose and breast cancer? There are no direct studies. Pepe looked at 200 milligrams and basically found after three years, there was no breast cancer. There was some increased breast density in the first year with all the treatment arms and the oral micronized progesterone group had the least when compared to placebo in the treatment arms, other than CE alone, which didn't cause an increase in uh, breast density. Keeps used 200 milligrams for four years. It was safe. Replenish used 100 milligrams. It was safe. Elite used 45 milligrams of vaginal progesterone in a five-year study. It was safe. Again, all of the commonly used doses that we have in our armamentarium do not increase breast cancer. In women without a uterus, you know that the oral micronized progesterone dose should accomplish the goal that you are trying to achieve. So key points, there is substantial evidence that transdermal estradiol alone does not increase breast cancer. There's also evidence that oral micronized progesterone is safe. Both million women's and E3N have design flaws be aware. And for those of you who throw it out there as it causes breast cancer, interpret with caution.
Here are the clinical pearls, all commonly used, low dose, 0 0.025 milligram patches, and gel doses, which are product specific, are safe and probably decrease breast cancer. Oral micronized progesterone doses that we use, 100 milligrams, 200 milligrams, are safe. Vaginal micronized progesterone, 45 milligrams, is safe. Vaginal micronized progesterone, 100, 200, has never been studied, but I would have to believe that they are safe because 200 milligrams of oral micronized progesterone is safe. These higher doses of vaginal micronized progesterone, a lot of times are used in reproductive clinics. They, they induce a separatory endometrium. And adding oral micronized progesterone is safe, even if you use it for 10 years. Age, when you initiate hormone therapy, does not impact breast cancer mortality. Green, what about compounded hormones? All you've done is talk about FDA-approved drugs. Well, let's talk about compounded hormones. There's presently only one study evaluating compounding hormones. It is a pharmacokinetic study. Yes, we all know compounded products work. We use them. However, be aware there's minimal to no data on dosing, laboratory findings, and or clinical success. So what I've come to for myself do is extrapolate when you can from the literature, rationalize when you must, but always individualized care. And here comes my lawyer hat. Please document why, when there's an available FDA approved product available, that you're choosing to use a compounded product. I've changed a lot of my practice patterns. Um, I use a lot of patches now. And you'll, I'll explain why in a bit. So my hope is that you've seen that replacing estradiol doesn't cause breast cancer, that in fact, it is breast protective. What about cardiovascular disease? Well, endogenous estradiol has numerous cardioprotective cardio effects. They have direct effects, indirect effects. They affect the vascular cells, the smooth muscle cells, and of course, the cardiomyocytes. Again, I group these according to outcomes. So where it says mixed results is because they had more than one treatment arm in there and one had one result, one had another result. Um, but let's look, look at the data. The bottom line is estradiol is safe, decreases cardiovascular event rates. DOPS that we talked about in breast cancer found a 50% decrease event rate. The Finnish data found that all estradiol-based hormone therapy decreased cardiovascular mortality up to 54%. Age and initiation had no impact on outcomes. But what about surrogate markers? These were hard outcomes. When you look at surrogate markers, KEEP showed no change in CIMT. Why was that? These women were so healthy, and the study was only four years long. Remember, cardiovascular disease is a very slow, progressive disease. Whereas in elite, the women were healthy, but not as squeaky clean healthy. This study was five years. And what they found is in women who were treated within six years of menopause had a statistically significant CIMP slowing. The women who were treated greater than 10 years, they were the same as the placebo group, no harm. However, when they looked at serum levels in their 2019 publication, what they found is that in the, in the early treatment arm, the estradiol levels with treatment, the higher they were, the less likely there would be CIMT progression. Whereas in the later treatment arm, the higher the estradiol levels, the more likely there would be CIMT progression. Caution. This was oral estradiol. They did not measure inflammatory markers. So just keep this in your back pocket when you see older women who you start on hormone, hormones later. It's not that I will change my practice at all. It's just something to be aware of. Maybe not pushing it to 1.8 nanograms, maybe keeping it at 1.2 to 1.5, and you'll see they'll get symptomatic relief. And remember, OMP and VMP, is uh, safe for the cardiovascular system. Again, all commonly used patches and gels are safe 
and probably decreased cardiovascular disease and breast cancer. Progesterone is necessary, does not increase breast cancer, and is safe for the cardiovascular system. So start hormones as early as you can. Time since menopause and age greater than 60 should cause pause, but not prevent hormone initiation or continuation. It's really key that you risk stratify patients and do ongoing risk stratification because risks change. And if you are going to be the prescriber of hormone therapy, it is your responsibility to make sure these things get done. You don't have to do them, but you need to make sure that they occur. So my hope is I've shown you that replacing uh, estradiol decreases, doesn't certainly doesn't increase cardiovascular disease, and it decreases cardiovascular disease. Now the question remains is the doses and the regimens that we just talked about, do they relieve symptoms? Do they protect bones? Do they improve cognitive function? And does the oral or vaginal progesterone doses add anything to vasomotor symptoms and or bone protection? Well, the answer is yes. And I group these together because I say the same thing over and over about them. And here's the bottom line. All FDA approved patches, including an ultra low dose patch and a low dose patch, relieve vasomotor symptoms at four weeks, improve vulvovaginal atrophy, and prevent osteoporosis. This Menistar patch, this 0.014 milligram patch, is not available anymore. I don't know why, but I put it in here to show you that really low doses, you don't need high doses to improve menopausal symptoms and prevent osteoporosis. FDA approved gels, those doses are product specific, but you see they relieve vasomotor symptoms, Divi gel 0.25, Estragel 0.375, and they also improve vulvovaginal atrophy. However, they take a little longer than patches do to see an effect. And they are not FDA approved for osteoporosis prevention. Why is that? Because Number one, to get FDA approval, has to be safe, they are, has to be effective, they are, but they have to be better than what we already have. And what you see is you can achieve a, the goals you want with a much lower patch dose, and so these are not FDA approved for osteoporosis prevention. But they do work at the higher doses. And what about progesterone? Progesterone works also. 100 and 300 milligrams improve vasomotor symptoms. It takes much longer. Uh, and really, what's important for progesterone and bones is a normal ovulatory cycle. So when all menstruating women have a high index of suspicion, because you need a normal luteal phase length for peak bone mineral density to obtain it and maintain it. In postmenopausal women, the optimum dose is unknown. And for those women who just have obovaginal atrophy symptoms, you can consider just local therapy. So here are your clinical pearls. The patch improves uh, vasomotor symptoms, vulvovaginal atrophy, and bone mineral density. Oral micronized progesterone is important for bone mineral density. And what they found in those studies is that osteoporosis prevention really occurred at serum levels somewhere between 20 and 40, or urine Dutch levels of 0.7 to 1.8 nanograms per milligram. Uh, so I watch that in my women. And in cycling women, normal cycle lengths do not equal ovulatory cycles. Do not let women talk you into a one-day test, a three-day test to look for ovulation. Do a cycle map. You need to look at the entire cycle. And once again, surveillance is key. And what about cognition? We know endogenous estradiol is very important for learning and memory. And we know that when menopausal transition starts and menopause occurs, there's a decrease in working memory and attention and really focus and sharpness. That's what I hear the most. Same question. Do the low doses that are safe and improve a, uh, vasomotor symptoms, vulvovaginal atrophy, and prevent osteoporosis? Do they improve cognitive function for Alzheimer's disease? And does progesterone add anything to this discussion? Well, the answer is no. And just again, I group them by outcome and 
you see that all of the studies congregate around no cognitive benefit. They're all randomized control trials. And so I would not document that you're using hormone therapy to improve cognition. We all see it works. However, there are no studies that document. So be cautious. The studies that do show benefit, the randomized control trials, they're small. Eight weeks, 12 weeks. They're not large studies. They're small studies. The observational Cache County study is a large study. In 2013, they documented if you start hormone therapy early, you will see cognitive benefits later in life. And in 2019, that publication basically said the longer you treat, the longer a woman is exposed to estradiol-based hormone therapy, the greater the benefits, especially later in life. We don't know the drugs, we don't know the doses, and we don't know the regimens. So here's the bottom line. Uh, Estana looked at 0.05 and 0.1 in uh Older postmenopausal women with mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, it shows promise. Climara 0.05 in recently symptomatic menopausal women. When I mean symptomatic, they had menopausal symptoms, not cognitive symptoms. Yeah, it worked. The Metastar Ultra Low Dose Patch didn't work. Oral micronized and vaginal micronized progesterone is safe. And whether the low dose patch works, nobody knows. I love this quote. Ignoring evidence leads to avoidable harm and failing to admit our uncertainties means we don't get better evidence. So please be flexible, be open-minded, don't have a stake in the ground. It's not all or nothing. We're always continuing to grow. I'm continuing to grow as, as I read more and more every day. And in order to continue best practice, we have to have the best evidence. We have to continue to grow as clinicians. And we have to take into account, very important, what the patient wants and the patient's health. That's how you get best practice. And putting it all together, a transdermal estradiol 0.025 milligram patch with either oral micronized progesterone or vaginal micronized progesterone works. Transdermal estradiol gels are a reasonable alternative. The doses are clearly product specific. And remember to, to achieve bone mineral density protection or maintenance, you need higher doses and ongoing follow-up uh, is necessary. And finally, women spend a third of their lives in menopause I think we owe it to them as clinicians that we get this right. And at this point, Mark, I'll hand it back to you. But before I do, please enjoy the conference and please be safe in this tumultuous time. Thank you, Dr. Saltiel. Appreciate that. I think a lot of the providers listening probably could say, I wish I had four months to take the 500 most relevant papers on hormone replacement therapy and read them and categorize them and then i would know with some confidence and so basically what we've done is we've done that for you um, that's the attempt here that we're making is to give you that information and you can see that dr sotil really just had to hit the highlights of that um, but just know again that that is all really well outlined in the document that we put together that goes through each of the risks and each of the benefits and looks at all of the studies um, and including the studies that have unfavorable outcomes and and there's discussion around those so i think that um, is important the other piece of this that is important is knowing how we're going to monitor hormone replacement therapy and that is really where I come in. And before we get into HRT and how do we monitor it and what levels are we shooting for, you know, I wanna just talk briefly about having a good baseline test because that's important too. So for me, for a baseline test, um, there are two options, serum and urine. Um, I think when you're looking at serum, you wanna get specific. So if you look at this study here, just real quickly, you can see that the kind of gold standard LCMS methods on the x-axis, your standard test is gonna be a little cheaper on the y-axis. And you look at that and you say, well, the, that looks like pretty good correlation. I'm good with either one. But if you zoom in here on the postmenopausal range, 
the standardized assays start to fall apart in that postmenopausal range. So for our discussion today, if we're talking serum, you really need to look at LCMS. Um, this is one of the reasons I don't prefer saliva testing for baseline tests because it's way down here and using similar technology as you see on the y-axis here, um, using amino assays and trying to get a really good number, um, it's going to be challenging. So to me, if you're, if you're going to stick with, with serum or saliva for any testing, when you're talking about HRT and baseline testing especially, you want to be talking about serum and LCMS. And a point to just sort of draw that out is look at the reference range of the estradiol assay that you're using. So if we use an example of LabCorp, who's a quality lab, and we look at the testing, you can see in this particular serum assay, the postmenopausal range is such that a result of, let's say, 50 is normal. And if you look at the premenopausal range, 50 is normal. So they're not separating the hormones sufficient from deficient. How do we do that? Well, go back to the same lab, but ask them for their LCMS assay, an ultra-sensitive assay, and you can see that there's much better separation with a postmenopausal range of less than 15 and a luteal range of 70 to 300. So that's the same lab testing the same sorts of samples, but with different technology. So you really want a sensitive assay, and that's what I really like about a good sensitive urine assay, like our Dutch assay, is when you look at the postmenopausal range here, 0 0.2 to 0 0.7, it's well separated from that luteal range, which means I can have a high degree of confidence in the fact that you are either sufficient or maybe moderately deficient or severely deficient. We can really define a woman well. This is the published correlation data that shows when you look at a sensitive serum assay and both progesterone on the top estradiol on the bottom, we're getting statistically equivalent values, again, for baseline testing with the Dutch test. So your options, Dutch, serum using LCMS, that's how we get a good baseline test. Then we talk about HRT. And the first thing we have to always ask is what's the route of administration? So this is the matrix that I've spent more than a decade putting together, which has changed over time as I've learned, is that when you look at what hormone you're taking, the route of administration, both of those things matter in terms of which tests are going to give you good feedback uh, for a given situation. Now, just some basic principles to be aware of. As you'll see if you dig through that matrix a little bit, not every scenario can be monitored in a way that's clinically meaningful. Some HRT can be given safely without monitoring. There are some situations um, where the testing can be helpful, but it's not always essential. Serum and urine testing have scenarios in which they do not work well. So we need to be aware of that. Now, here are the, the two big reasons why a, either a serum test or a urine test wouldn't work very well. If the pattern of your hormone change is very fast, up and down, very fast, serum's gonna be difficult. And if you're swallowing a lot of your hormone, and I'm particularly talking about estrogen, um, that's not gonna work very well. So for example, when we look at sublingual hormones, a urine test doesn't work very well because you swallow some of it, and that's going to give you confusing urine results. And if you look at serum, it's going to move up and down too fast. So in that particular situation, there isn't really a good lab value uh, to help. Now, for today, our conversation is really focusing in on oral progesterone and then estradiol patches, which we can see here, and then transdermal estrogen, where we, we mean by that creams and gels. Okay, so we're gonna talk about that a little bit. And the one thing that you'll see here is that I am not recommending serum testing for oral progesterone. Now, serum testing works fine to monitor progesterone when it's a baseline, but you cannot use serum or saliva to monitor oral progesterone effectively. Let me show you why. Two reasons, and they're both deal breakers. One is an accuracy issue in this particular situation. And one is what we talked about, this is the kinetics. Picture, if you will, a woman going to bed and right before she takes oral progesterone. What the data shows is that two hours later, that lab value in serum or saliva is gonna peak and then it comes back down. She wakes up in the morning, maybe eight hours later and goes and does a test. You've missed all of the action, right? If we bring in a study that looked at the same thing, so the blue line, the left and the right here are essentially the same thing. 
serum following oral progesterone. And the one on the left adds in saliva, which just shows it's the same pattern. So one, if we test at eight or 10 hours, we're missing what's going on. So the kinetics are a problem, but it's worse than that because we can see over here on the right, there's also an accuracy issue. So they drew these serum samples and they could have done the same thing with saliva. They tested them and got the values we see in blue. Then they went back into the same samples and monitored them with LCMS, which gives you a more accurate value. Why? Because when you take it orally, you get lots of metabolites from gut metabolism. Those metabolites look a lot like progesterone. A mass spec assay is not fooled by that. So at two hours, you're back to baseline. But when you take that same serum sample and measure it with your standard assay, you get a false positive, if you will. So there's an accuracy issue. There's a kinetic issue. At the end of the day, you do not want to chase these values until you hit some sort of arbitrary target, right? Now, why would we want to use a urine test with oral progesterone? Well, let's think about what we're doing with oral progesterone. What's the benefit of oral over vaginal? Well, if you look at this study on the bottom, they're showing the rise in allopregnanolone, and you can see it's not very significant. With vaginal, you take it orally, you get a huge push in allopregnanolone. So it's, it's acting as a pro-hormone. I'm dosing allopregnanolone by giving you progesterone. So there's a, a progesterone effect, and there's also that sedating effect you get from the metabolites, which is why we might take it orally. And if you do, a good way to peer in on the effects of that is to look at the Dutch test. Why? Because we're looking at those more active alpha, think allopregnanolone, alpha metabolites, or the less impactful and less active beta metabolites. So with this woman, she's on oral progesterone. She doesn't make very much of the sedating metabolites. If she's not sleeping well, maybe you give her a little bit more. But look at the woman on the bottom. She's making gobs of the alpha metabolite, right? Me meaning she preferentially in her gut really pushes it down the alpha pathway. The intestinal mucosa metabolizes it down that particular pathway. And for her, it's pretty extreme, which means if she's not sleeping well and she's making lots of that, you probably want to investigate melatonin, cortisol, things that might impact her sleep instead of just giving her more oral progesterone. So that's some good feedback. But the bottom line with progesterone is the testing can be frustrating. As Doreen showed us, oral and vaginal progesterone are proven to protect the endometrium. Transdermal is not. But as it relates to what's going on in the endometrium, none of the tests in any of these scenarios really tell you what's going on in the endometrium. You can get some good feedback in some of these situations about systemic progesterone, about the metabolism of progesterone, but you never really have a, a test that matches up with any of those that really gives you an idea of what's going on in the endometrium. What's that, what does that mean? It means the information that Doreen just gave you is critical to understand what the studies say about the impact on the endometrium of different dosages of both oral and vaginal progesterone. Now, what about transdermal estrogen replacement therapy? How do we monitor that? I really like the data we get from the Dutch test. When we look at postmenopausal women, they're down here in the postmenopausal range. When we use commonly used dosages of the lower forms of patches, gels, and creams, we get a similar rise in the urine and it continues to scale up. So what you notice is the lower dose of patches and gels push just out of the postmenopausal range, and the higher dose will push you into the luteal range. When you compare that with serum, this is patch data. The low dose patch bumps you up and out of the postmenopausal range. The high dose patch bumps you into the luteal range. When we look at gels, we see a similar pattern. At a, at a dose of 0.25 to 0.5, you start to emerge out of the postmenopausal range, and at the higher doses, you enter the luteal range. Now that's patches and that's gels. What about creams? Now Doreen mentioned there's only one published study, this is it, that shows serum values for compounded estradiol creams. So what I've put here for creams, you see on the bottom in yellow, is sort of a caution to say, yeah, the serum will go up a little bit. Look at this 0.6 dose that sends the serum up here. But if you lower the dose just a little bit to 0.5, if you don't test in those first couple hours, you're gonna miss it entirely. So there's a kinetic issue here. And if you have a urine 
sample set that represents the entirety of the day, I think that's a better representation of the creams. But again, there's limited data out there to help us. But when urine is better than serum is when there is this fast up and down pattern. So when you have fast up and down kinetics, a urine test, so for gels and creams, is probably a better option. Now, you hear a lot out there about saliva testing. A lot of times people saying it has unique value and should be preferred for creams and gels. And I used to think that myself until I did similar a similar thing to what uh, Dr. Saltiel did with hormone replacement is I dug into the data to say, okay, what really makes sense here? Because I published this data back in 2008. These are expected levels. So here's your premenopausal range. And here's the average woman 24 hours after taking a dose of 0.3 in saliva. Now, remember, 24 hours means what? You're ready for the next dose. So if you were to test this, these women at 12 hours, you get a value about up in here. So they're spending the entirety of their day at a super physiological level with a low dose. So that's a very different message than you get in serum or urine. And that leads us into this big question that I wanted to explore with you. It's really under, important to understand the data. The salivary response greatly exceeds what we see in serum or urine. So which one is right? And in order to ask that question, we need to look at the clinical data. So show me the studies for estradiol. So I dug through all the studies I could find. And what I found is that all of the studies seem to align with the response you see in serum or urine, meaning vasomotor symptoms. When we look at studies, so here, here is a list of studies where they looked at vasomotor symptoms compared to placebo. And what these studies all show is the dose that begins to move those levels outside the postmenopausal range. So that's a, a level at which the saliva is very, very elevated. You see the impact is, is mild. So it, it doesn't match the impact you see at higher doses, but you start to see some impact. When we look at bone mineral density, we see the same thing. When the serum gets into a level that aligns with what we know to be true in terms of bone mineral density increase, you start to see that bone mineral density increase. And as you decrease the serum levels by decreasing the dose, we get less impact on the bone. Vaginal atrophy, same thing. So vaginal atrophy, when we use this dose of 0.3 with a product like DiviGel, it actually failed. No improvement in vaginal atrophy, even though saliva at that dose is way up in the super physiological range. And what we see from serum on that specific product is it has not yet emerged from the postmenopausal range and it's failing clinically. When you get the level outside the postmenopausal range, but just barely, we see success with vasomotor symptoms. We see success with vaginal atrophy, but we get mild success on bone mineral density until we go up one more dosage level. So the values that we see in serum and the values that we see in urine really align nicely with the clinical data, which essentially says once you push outside the postmenopausal range, you start to see improvement from all of the symptoms that we have data on. Right? And as we get into the premenopausal range, that continues to increase in terms of bone mineral density or relief of hot flashes. So the space in between is really a nice space to be, whether you're in serum or in urine. Now, what's the other benefit of a urine test is that we can look at the metabolites. So if we look at a woman like this and we say, okay, I'm gonna measure your estrogen in serum or in urine, and guess what? It's elevated, right? You're outside that premenopausal range here of 1.8 to 4.5. So we say, well, let's look a little further at our metabolites and we see the carcinogenic 4-hydroxy is high, the estrogenic 16-hydroxy is high, but the more protective 2-hydroxy estrogen is on the lower side. So it looks like this pathway is blocked to a degree. Well, we know what opens that pathway, right? Diendylmethane, cruciferous vegetables, indole 3 carbonyl And look what happens when we put this particular woman on a product like that is all these primary estrogens come down because we've opened up this channel and the 2-hydroxy estrogen increases. So we feel better about her relative risk for breast cancer and she's feeling better because her estrogen dominance 
has been improved because we took a more strategic approach by having a urine test that just offers us more information. So to conclude on testing, serum's a good option for patches, a reasonable option for gels, just know it's gonna go up and down a little bit throughout the day and probably not advisable with the creams because that up and down pattern might be too extreme for serum testing to be effective. Use LCMS, target around 20 to 40, maybe as high as 60 if you're looking for more clinical impact and do not use serum for oral progesterone. With Dutch, a great option for oral progesterone with any transdermal estrogen product. We're gonna target this range right here. The purple range you see there is the postmenopausal range. 1.8 to 4.5 is the premenopausal range. And right in between is that sweet spot where you start to see clinical impact. And there isn't really a reason in most cases to push beyond that. And then furthermore, phase one metabolites and methylation, we wanna look at that as well. The nice thing about Dutch, it's a dried urine test for comprehensive hormones. That's what the acronym stands for because we can look at all of these things we just talked about with estrogen. We can look at progesterone, but in addition, we can look at testosterone and its metabolites. We can look at the cortisol pattern. We can look at cortisol production. We can look at B6, B12 deficiency, an oxidative stress marker, melatonin production. So all of these things we can look at in Dutch. Functional medicine used to be really popular for people to look at your sex hormones in serum as we've listed here. And then to say, you know what? Cortisol doesn't work very well in serum. Let's go to saliva to look at that free cortisol pattern. Maybe we even include the cortisol awakening response. All of those things can be looked at with the Dutch test. But in addition, we're looking at so much more. And that's really the value of that test. But as we've shown, it's also a really nice monitoring tool for most situations that are used prevalently by providers just like you. So I hope this has been helpful to you. Do keep in mind, we have this really nice document that Dr. Saltiel and I have created. Uh, we will offer that to you after uh, this webinar. We hope you enjoy the rest of your conference. And if you're looking for more information on our testing, uh, new providers with us do have an opportunity to get up to five at half price to kind of see where this fits in your practice. And if you have questions about this, or hormone replacement therapy or monitoring, we do really wanna be a resource for you in that area. So we hope you enjoyed this talk and we look forward to continuing to work with you.